thanks for having me. Uh, I'm excited to be on this side of this room. I've had several fun occasions sitting on that side. I hope the next hour is not going to be too much of a pain, especially given the weather outside, which is great. Um, I realize that this is a very diverse, very heterogeneous group. And so my, that's my excuse for not making this too scholarly or too <laughs> inaccessible. Um, that's my cop out. But what I will try and do is uh, talk about a stream of research that I've been working on for the last um, four or five years uh, on a topic that many of us relate to, some of us more better than others, and that is obesity and overweight and food and exercise and things like that. Um, and what I'm going to do is in this stream of research, we started out very micro, which is, you know, my, most of my work is on psychology and, uh, and decision making and so on. So we started off from there. And what we realized through a series of accidents is that this actually feeds into a fairly macro um, phenomenon. And there are um, various disciplines that have lots to say about this. And some of these disciplines are not disciplines that we were trained in. Um, but we still decided to go ahead and say what we had to say anyway. Um, and therefore, please feel free to push back and inform us, because this is an ongoing stream of research. And um, it's something about which everybody has an opinion, um, as you will see. OK, so with that preamble, here we go. First, lay theories of obesity. What exactly is a lay theory? Um, and I always saw, start off by explaining what a lay theory is. A lot of my research is on lay theories by talking about a scientific theory, right? And here's a story that you all know. Galileo went to the top of the Leaning Tower of Pisa, threw down two cannonballs, one small, one big. Why did he do that? It's because everybody had a lay theory, a belief that the large one is going to get to the ground earlier than the small one, right? But Newton's laws, which we all know, we've learned them in school, actually that's not the case. They both reach the ground at the same time, right? Today, if we were to run this simulation again, that's Galileo with his hat. Nobody uses cannonballs anymore. In Trump's era, we use computers and supercomputers. You take two large computers, you take a supercomputer, and you take an iPad, and you drop them from the top of the Leaning Tower of Pisa. Which one reaches first? Obviously, the faster computer reaches first. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for paying attention. Um, that's not the point. The point is that this is a university of science and technology. And we have all passed our 10th grade physics exam where we all learned that formula, which I'm sure you're not trying to remember. But the point of the formula is that mass cancels out. It doesn't matter. They're both going to reach the ground at the same rate. Right? That is a scientific theory. But despite that, if you go downstairs and you find any person on the street, chances are they will say, you know what? Grand piano falling, get out of the way. It's going to get here really quickly. Right? That is a lay theory. People have lay beliefs about various phenomena. Some physical phenomena, such as how fast does a big thing fall. Some non-physical phenomena, like economic phenomena. Here's the price of an object. I now have to make an estimate about the quality of this object. There are some people who will say the higher the price, the better the quality. Right? That's a lay belief about the price-quality association. So you can have lay beliefs in lots and lots of different domains. And the point is, these lay beliefs are essentially assumptions. They're assumptions that we pick up from our experience with our day-to-day -day environment. They're often implicit, meaning we don't say these out loud. We don't write them in our diaries, but they exist in our heads. And they help give meaning to our environment, um, which basically says, if I find myself in a situation where there is a large price, a high price thing, I say, wow, this must be really good. right? And so we use our lay beliefs to interpret the situations we find ourselves in. And this is a point I'll come back to later. Um, and research has found that these are systematic and predictable influences on behavior. Um, the person who really pioneered the study of lay theories is uh, someone called Carol Dweck. And maybe you're familiar with her work. And what she found is that people do hold lay theories in many domains. The one that she studied most was the lay theory of intelligence. Do you believe that intelligence is a fixed quantity, a fixed commodity? There's a certain amount you're born with, and that's your stock for the rest of your life. Or do you believe it's something that you work on, and it can grow and adapt with effort? And what she found, and you know, um, her academic disciplines, uh, dis disciples have found, uh, that lay beliefs about the causes of failure. Do you believe it's attributed to intelligence or effort? These predict helplessness, drops in self-esteem, and actually eventually grades. And there's 25 years of research on lay theories of intelligence as well. I got interested in this as a second year, a first year graduate student. And um, I've done a lot of work on this. Today I'm going to talk about lay theories of obesity. 
And basically the idea is what do normal people, what do you believe is the main cause of obesity? Do you believe it's poor diet? Or do you believe it's insufficient exercise? And so what? In one slide, what we find is that the more you believe that it's insufficient exercise rather than poor diet that causes obesity, the more likely you are to actually be overweight or obese. <laughs> I'm here to bust some bubbles today. Controlling for a lot of things statistically. Why? Because if you attribute it to exercise, you just eat more because you think you can burn it off. Some of this misperception, um, some is the technically uh, you know, appropriate term. Uh, if you ask me what I feel in my heart of hearts, I'd use a stronger word than some. Some of this is attributable to marketing in an indirect way, which had not been realized, we feel, until we started thinking about it. And therefore, we believe there is an urgent need for decisive action. What sorts of action? I'm going to get to that about half an hour from now. OK. So what's the point here? Um, the point here that marketers love food, and food loves marketing. These two go very well hand in hand. The food industry is among the top advertisers in the US media market and every media market. Billions and billions of dollars being spent on food. A lot of it is being aimed at children. Um, and a lot of it is iconic and therefore successful and therefore imitated. And because it's all around us, essentially we start believing that unhealthy eating, which is frequent snacking on food that is calorie dense but poor in nutrients, dense in calories, poor in nutrients, is normal, it's fun, and it's socially rewarding. So the example that I often use for this is supposing, let's say for example, um, you have a seven-year-old daughter, and the seven-year-old daughter goes to play a soccer game, and she loses. What do you say? You say, oh, that's too bad, it's okay, you tried, it's all right, next time you'll do better, I'll make you feel better, let's go to McDonald's. <laughs> um, this is all fictional. <laughs> My wife is in the audience. <laughs> Supposing instead, as always happens, your seven-year-old daughter wins the game. Then what do you do? Well done! Let's celebrate! Take you to McDonald's. And so what happens is, regardless of whether you win or you lose, or it's a normal day because, you know, there's nothing else to do, you end up going to McDonald's. Because that's just what we do, that's part of our lives, that's what we learn to do, and therefore when we become parents, that's what our kids learn to do as well, and these things get transferred down the generations. Um, Marketing has been all about special occasions. So when I teach marketing, I say, you have to link your brand to usage occasions. And a special usage occasion makes your brand special. And of course, food marketers have been at the forefront of this. Right? So on Memorial Day weekend or any holiday, Pepsi for you. Or if it's a normal day, just like I said, have it your way, go to Burger King. Right? So if it's a special day, a normal day, a sexy day, you have food linked in there. And so then what happens is, as people, we love food. But it's not quite clear to me that food loves people. Because of which, um, because of that, I mean, why am I saying that? It's because food is emerging as a major issue worldwide. And there are plenty of problems with food quality. There's adulteration. So you know, you think you're drinking milk powder. Actually, you're drinking powdered melamine. That could be a problem. Um, there's this whole deal with factory farming. About 40 years ago, we realized that, you know, Malthusian problems, we have too many mouths to feed, we need to grow more food, and so let's make things efficient, just like we made things efficient with Model T Fords in the 1920s. Let's do that with crops. Okay, so let's have monocultures and let's just create more so that people don't starve. Well, what's happening is monocultures create safety issues because you don't have crop diversity. And that means if you have single crop in a vast expanse of space, one infection at this end of your state means the entire state's crops are gone. Right? So that's a problem. There are nutritional issues with losses of nutri uh, nutrient diversity. Um, one crop basically extracts one type of nutrient or a single profile of nutrient from the soil. And therefore, over time, these nutrients get selectively depleted. Plus, if you're trying to plant the same thing three times a year instead of one thing every three, the same thing every three years, then the root systems of these crops get shorter and shorter and shorter and thinner and thinner and thinner, less dense. And so they're able to extract less nutrients from the soil. So that's a problem. You have these environmental issues with land usage. You've got ethical issues. You've probably seen pictures of you know, animals cramped into totally inhumane situations. Um, GMOs, which is something that we've started um, investigating recently with IEMS funding. Thank you very much. And so I have some preliminary data on that. These are problems. One way to fix the problems 
is labeling. So you say you put the information on the packet so people will know what they're eating, right? And then they should be able to account for it. Well, there are many problems with that. First, you don't know whether people notice the labels. Even if they notice the labels, you don't know whether they read them or not. Even if they read them or not, you don't know whether they understand what's written on them or not. And even if they understand, you don't know whether they actually use them in their decision making. Right? So there are many, many slips between literally the cup and the lip in this case. And these are all problems. And then, of course, there's this thing about additives. Because we want to feed more people and we want food to stay stable and not spoil, we want to put additives in order to keep them. But then what happens is stuff like this. You've got McDonald's French fries containing 17 ingredients. French fries should usually be potatoes, oil, and salt. Um, these have potatoes, yes, but they have various different types of oil in them. And then they have got all these other things, silico, aluminate, dextrose, potassium iodide as a kind of salt. There's something in there called THBQ. I mean, I know what BBQ is. We had BBQ last night. <laughs> that was pretty good. Um, while I was at this dinner last night, I heard there's THC happening in the underground halls. I know what THC is. That's a different thing. But what is THBQ? No one really knows. Is it good for you? Is it bad for you? No one really knows. And maybe that's a problem. And then what's happening is we're having more and more of the bad stuff, right? So we've heard about supersizing. Um, this is a real thing. You can pour a whole bottle of wine into a Starbucks venti ice container. It's basically that's how much you're drinking when you get a Starbucks venti ice. And today I learned that Starbucks venti ice is not even the largest size. There's something called a trenta, which is about a liter. So you drink a liter every time you drink, right? There's a lot of stuff in there. Um, in graphs, because we are scientists, in the 1950s, you would get fries as one portion, that's two ounces, right? Um, in the 2000s, the small size is bigger than the only size from 50 years ago. If you're a behavioral scientist, you know everyone's going to choose the medium. The medium is more than twice the normal dose. Um, soda. Today, the child's size is double the adult size from 50 years ago. And again, you know, everyone's going to take the medium. That's more than three times as large. And that's how much you're consuming just normally. Right? That's just more and more intake. And this is the apotheosis of the supersize phenomenon. There's actually a place called Heart Attack Grill in Las Vegas. This gentleman actually was the mascot of the celebrity endorser for Heart Attack Grill. Um, truth in advertising, unfortunately, he died of a heart attack three years ago. That's one sad thing about the story. But to me, the other sad thing about this story is um, part of the photograph that I haven't shown you, which is the same person who's eating this burger and these fries is also drinking a Diet Coke which to me is a very, very succinct summary of exactly how messed up our relationship is with food. As a result, no surprise, people are becoming heavier. That's what I look like in my prime. This is how I stand before you today. Uh, my television set is much more sleek, of course. Um, in 2004, we had 66% of US adults overweight or obese, which has doubled you know, over the last 20 years. Now the number is well above 70%. Stunningly, there are more people overweight in the world than starving today. More overweight people than starving in the world. And the economic cost is $2 trillion a year. McKinsey came out with this report a couple of years ago, where essentially they say that the sum total of the economic cost of obesity is $2 trillion. It's the same order of magnitude. It's almost equal to the, the, the total cost of smoking or the total cost of armed violence, war, and terrorism all put together. That's how much money we are paying for people eating too much. And this is a major problem worldwide. So, you know, I've had several conversations about this with people, and you look at this and you say, we're in Asia, we're okay. It's not us, you know? It's not us. <laughs> the yellow, orange countries are the ones that are in problem. We're okay. We're in China. We're at a comfortable 5.6%. Unfortunately, not quite. First, Institute for Emerging Market Studies, you see actually the number one, two, three, four countries in the world are emerging markets. These are the Pacific nation countries, right? That's one thing. Two, the countries that we look at, like China or India, where I'm from, the rate, the prevalence looks low, but that's because the denominators are extremely large. 
And to me, the best, again, anecdotal, anecdotal data of that is from a small town in, in not a small town, a, a district capital, a provincial capital in India. It's called Lucknow. It's got more than a million people, so it's not small. Um, data from there, uh, looking at um, high school kids, comparing government schools, which is where you know, poor people go, with private schools, which is where rich people go. In the government schools, the prevalence of obesity is 0.1% or something like that, prevalence of overweight. It's really negligible. In the, uh, in the private schools, it's up at 40%, right up with industry standards worldwide. Um, and this number 40%, I seem to come up on it everywhere. I was telling Albert, um, if you look at China, yeah, the prevalence is like 5.6%. In Shanghai, 40%. If you look in China at the young kids, you know, below 19 years old who go to a certain type of school, 40%. I went to South Korea, 40%. Singapore, 40%. Um, the numbers are pretty high, and um, they're not comfortable. And what's worse is the growth rates. The growth rates are, the, are what's stunning. And the, the, the good data available is from the US. So let me just show you, because pictures are worth thousands of words. Um, this is the map of the United States. And what we have here is the prevalence of obesity. So that means the body mass index greater than 30. Body mass index is essentially your weight divided by the square of your height. Okay? Um, in metric units, if it's above 30, you're called obese. If it's above 25, you're called overweight. If you're between 20 and 25, you're okay, you're normal. Um, and so we have some, some states that are white, that's no data. Light blue is less than 10%. Dark blue is 10 to 14%. All right, and this is in 1990. I'm going to step forward one year, and we have a new category, 15 to 19%, and we have a few states hitting that threshold, including Alberts and my old home, Michigan, going blue, as we can see. 92, 93, 4, 5, 6, 7, new category, 8, 9, 2000, 2001, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Not a single blue state. They've all turned red. Doesn't that look familiar? <laughs> <laughs> Compare and observe. In 1990, the highest category was 10%. In 2010, the lowest category is 20%. In 20 short years, that's what happened in the US, which was already high to begin with. Think about what must be happening in the parts of the world that we live in and we call home and we like to study at the IEMS. That is the scope of the problem. But we know that the problem exist, exists. So, you know, everyone's trying to lose weight. Look around this room. I'm not going to shame you by asking you who's trying to lose weight or who's concerned about the weight. You know, two and three people are trying to lose weight. Um, Gallup says so. How are people like to, trying to lose weight? Well, either you don't eat that or you do more of that. And of course, as a business person, I know that you're spending lots of money on both of these things, right? And there's no shortage of advice out there. Any bookstore you go to, any airport you go to, there's all these sorts of books out there. Um, the tabloids are all over it. So for example, exercise holds the key to keeping weight off. Exercise is the key to fighting a flab. Diet takes the second place. You look at that and you say, okay. But no, 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 no. Somebody else says obesity is caused by eating too much. It's diet, not exercise. Exercise won't make you thin. Like, huh. Then you say, wait, no, there's a fat gene. Found by scientists. Scientists found it, so it has to be a thing. But no, 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 it's not a thing, it's a myth. There's a myth of the fat gene. But no, here I am to tell you that actually the fat gene does exist, but it can be trumped by exercise. So basically, there is absolutely no consistency in the information out there. So what are you going to think? Right? What is a poor girl to think? You think, hmm, maybe weight gain does come from too much food, so I should watch what I eat. Or you think weight gain comes from not enough exercise, I should go to the gym. Because you have these messages going, floating around and you're going to form your opinion based on which of these you find more compelling. And eventually everybody arrives at some sort of conclusion for themselves. This is caused by diet, or by exercise, or by genes. Are we allowed to ask questions? I guess you are allowed to ask questions. So I'm just curious, why does it have to be one or the other? Um, it could be any of these. It could be more, it could be combinations as well. Right? But if you ask people, what is the one thing, what is the one factor that's most likely to make you succeed in an exam? Okay? As opposed to, what are the five things that are most likely to make you succeed in an exam? Right? People who say five things are essentially going to end up doing nothing on those five. They will put most of their effort on the first one. Right? So given that it is so difficult to act on this anyway, 
right? What we felt was that you identify the principal factor because the principal factor is the one that's most likely to be acted upon. Yeah, thanks. Um, and that's why we said, okay, so the main cause of obesity, we're gonna call a person's lay theory of obesity. And we have thought somewhat about this question. What happens if people attribute it to more than one factor? There's two ways to think about it. One is to look at the data. And we've conducted many studies, some of which I'll show you, the data are completely inconclusive, which is why I have nothing better to say about that. The other is that we feel that people who are actually getting it right should be the healthiest. But what, again, going back to the data, what we find is the number of people who actually get it right is so small that they don't really show up in any sample that we can study meaningfully. Okay? So in theory, yes. People who have the exact right answer should be the most healthy people, but they just don't seem to show up in our samples. Okay, um, which lay theories would most people hold out of diet, exercise, or genes? Before going to the data, here's our speculation. We know, people believe that individuals can control their own weight. There's a lot of fat shaming out there, there's a lot of stigma associated with obesity. If you gain weight, then it's your fault. So there is a lay belief that you can control your own weight. We also know that you can change your diet, you can change your exercise, but you can do nothing about your genetic code. And there are many, many factors related to obesity um, identified in the medical literature, sleep patterns, smoking, where you live, you know, rural versus urban, things like that. These influence people's food choices or their behavior patterns, their exercise patterns. But these are not primary causes in and of themselves. So based on this, our reasoning was that the two most commonly held lay theories of obesity should be overconsumption of food, what we call poor diet, or lack of exercise. Okay, so that was proposition one. And then the question is, so what? How does this matter? And basically this matters because of this. Recall, uh, about 10, 15 minutes ago, I said, your lay beliefs influence your behavior. If you find yourself in a situation, your behavior is going to be influenced by what you believe about that situation, right? And we find ourselves in situations where there's, you know, tempting food all the time. And when you find yourself in that situation, you look at that food, and things flash through your mind. You say, no, mm, bad news, avoid, avoid. And then you look at it again, and the cake looks at you. And then you say, well, you know, I did just go to the gym on Tuesday. I did, I think. So you think a little more. And you say, and if I eat the cake, I'll hit the gym later. So that, that, that works. And so then what we do is we weigh these factors, and either we skip the temptation altogether, or we let ourselves eat the cake, promising ourselves we're gonna burn off these extra calories later, right? The problem is we are biased. We are biased in many, many ways. We underestimate the calories we intake and we also overestimate what we burn while we exercise. Just as an example, here's a McDonald's large triple thick vanilla shake. Any guesses about the number of calories in it? 600, 600 going 600, anyone more than 600? <laughs> 500. <laughs> 500, 1,000, the big hitter is hitting the, now. 600, 500, 1,000? 1,200. 1,200. The finance professor wins. It is actually 1,110. <laughs> Utpal is going to win a triple thick shake <laughs> with 28 grams of fat in it. Any idea of um, how many hours of walking for a normal person on a flat surface? 10 hours. 10? 10? 20. 20. 20. 20. Anyone for 30? No, it's seven. Only seven. Only seven hours of walking. Come on. You can do this. Seven. Who goes walking for seven hours? It takes a week to do that. Exactly. Nobody goes walking for seven hours. It's impossible, right? But you tell yourself, I'm going to burn this off and you walk for 30 minutes. And you feel really good, so you reward yourself with another one of these. I've been such a good kid, I just went to the gym for 30 minutes, right? And we reward ourselves with additional consumption, and often we eat more calories than the exercise burn, and the cycle just keeps perpetuating. And what really causes obesity? Is it not working out enough? Is it genetics? Is it not eating too, uh, properly? We know that people are eating more today than they ate 20, 30 years ago. Exercise rates are stagnant, although intentions keep going up. Gym memberships have doubled, intentions keep going up. Number of people who say they regularly exercise keeps going up. The human genome has stayed exactly the same in the last 20 years, it could not have morphed. 
And if you just eliminate one large Coke, you've got 250 calories. And that's basically an hour of cycling to burn. If you don't drink one large Coke every day, assuming that that's your normal routine, you would lose 30 pounds in the year. All other things constant. Right? That's the effect of diet. Rashmi. It's, it's two things. It's the overconsumption of food, right? And the corn syrup type food. And two is uh, uh, decline in nutrients. So the nutrient profiles of food have plummeted over the last 50 years of the same foods. And I'm not just talking about burgers. I'm talking about like an apple or an ear of corn. It gives far less nutrients. And my hypothesis, which is not medically supported, but based on what I've read, is that when you eat food that does not have that nutrient profile, your body is not satiated, and so you want to eat more. Yep. Yeah. We could just cut out all the calories, but still eat the same amount of food, right? If you just drink diet coke instead of your uh, one five ninety one ml. Right, but then you're ingesting other things, and there isn't enough research on what sorts of what those chemicals are doing to you either. So, yeah, calories are a major part of it, and then there are nutrients. And here we're just taking the macro problem, which is calories. We haven't even got to the nutrients yet. Um, right. And the doctors actually have it out pretty cold. So they said, uh, this is the Journal of the American Medical uh, Association said that clearly it's environmental causes for obesity are more influential than genes. Environmental means outside your body, such as diet or exercise. Obesity results from overnutrition, English, eating too much. And the primary therapeutic <laughs> target is preventing or reversing overeating. Exercise is associated with weight loss, but its duration or intensity has minor effects on weight loss relative to diet. Translation, yes, exercise can make you lose weight, but the effect of exercise is much smaller than the effect of diet. Exercise has many other benefits for your health, but if, if you just want to lose weight, exercise is clearly second. Right? So that's what the doctors say. So this is the right answer. And therefore, our two predictions, the first is that people will have these two lay theories, poor diet, not enough exercise. And the second is the diet theorists, because they're getting it right, should have a lower BMI. Right? Um, now, we ran plenty of studies to support various parts of these conjectures. I'm just going to show you two of these. First, um, from South Korea, we had 254 South Koreans, um, nice and young. And we asked them, what is the primary cause of obesity? Is it eating too much, not exercising enough, or genetic factors? And we asked them their age, gender, height, and weight. And from the height and weight, self-reported, we can compute BMI. And what we found, what is the primary cause of obesity? 50% say poor diet, 41% say insufficient exercise. And across all our studies, we find that this combination is at 80% or above, everywhere we go. And genetics is always between 10 and 20%. And there's a few people who say stuff like, my wife makes me really sad and want to overeat. Um, those we count as you know, the error term. Um, in terms of BMI, the poor diet people have a BMI of 21.55. Normal is 20. For the WHO, the World Health Organization, overweight is 25. But for the South Korean government, because they have stricter standards for their citizens, 23 is the bar for being overweight. Insufficient exercise, I'm afraid the South Korean government thinks you're overweight, 23.10. Genetic factors, exactly in the middle. What does this really mean? Well, you can take this difference of 1.5 BMI units and use that to back calculate the difference in weight for an average person. For, so for a, a person of average height in South Korea, 1.7 meters, this is basically a four, a four kilogram difference. It's like a nine or 10 pound difference in weight, simply by believing the wrong thing. So yes, we find, as predicted, the diet theorists have lower BMI than the exercise theorists. And if you look at people who are only overweight, most of them were exercise theorists, very few were diet theorists. We found um, very similar patterns in several other countries, including France, and I'm going to zip through this. Here, um, we had a similarly sized French sample, and we asked them a whole bunch of other things that are related to obesity. Um, the, so, you know, there are publications showing each of these factors has an independent effect. Um, 
And we also asked them to rate the strength of their lay theory. And we asked them a whole bunch of other psychological measures that also should have an effect. And essentially what we find is that if you throw everything in as a predictor except the lay theories, then you have gender and education, and then whether they're a smoker or not, and their overall health as predictors of BMI. If you add in the genetics lay theory, it does absolutely nothing. And then if you add in the diet lay theory, that does have an effect. It's negative, meaning the more strongly you believe it's poor diet, the lower your BMI is going to be. And the magnitude is very similar to these other things, such as gender and education, whether you're a smoker or not. Right? Um, pictorially, if you plot the strength of the belief in the diet lay theory, zero means diet has absolutely no effect. 100 means it's only diet, nothing else. And you have the BMI on the y-axis. So 25, again, is overweight. 30 is obese. This is a scatter plot of all the data. What we find is that if you attribute it only to diet, you're likely to be normal. If you say diet has nothing to do with it, then you're likely to be overweight. What, Paul? Why is gender mattering so much? French women don't get fat. The effect is robust. Yeah, I, I, I love the way I kill that one. I'm sorry. But it just turns out that in France, French women are less likely to put on weight. It's a cultural factor. There are books written about that. Um, that that's not true across countries? That women it's not true across countries, no, no. Um, especially um, in sub-Saharan Africa, that's not true. The effect is robust. Um, we, we ran several studies, like I said, which I'm not going to go through, which do all sorts of psychological robustness testing, you know, sorts of things that you need to get published in a psych journal. Um, and so this was, at that time, um, this paper came out in 2013. It was a new way of thinking about the problem. Um, and we were happy with it, um, except people would always ask us, where do these beliefs come from? I'm going to skip through the summary of this. And people would always ask us, where do these beliefs come from? Where do lay theories come from? And like I said, I've done some research on lay theories. And the answer to that is really a hand-waving answer. Oh, lay theories come from society. They come from your parents. They come from socialization. They come from the kids' friends, things like that. Right? And so my co-author, Brent, was presenting this at uh, an internal Michigan uh, brown bag seminar. And there was somebody sitting at the back who said, I'll tell you where these come from. These come from food companies. So we said, oh, that's interesting. And you know, uh, some, a little while later, we actually started looking into this. Um, coincidentally, about um, the time that the paper was getting accepted in the journal, and you know, for the grad students in the audience, luck plays such a big deal, such a, such a big role in your research. About the same time as I was writing this paper up and revising it and getting it in the journal, and the diet theory and exercise theory were all in my mind, the TV was on in my household, and TV is usually never on in my household except for sports. But there was the Arab Spring going on, and we were changing channels, and we flipped to CNN, which I don't think ever since then has ever been on in my household. And there was this guy, Farid Zakaria, interviewing somebody. And he was saying, we have three times the rate of obesity as Europe. They say it is because of the snacks and fast food and high calorie drinks. And that just stopped my attention, right? That caught my attention. Because the person he was talking to is a rock star in India, the CEO of PepsiCo, Indra Nui. And she said, I wish the solution was that simple. When I was a kid, I would come home from school, throw my bag, go out to play. My daughter comes home from school, throws her bag, goes to play but sitting in front of the computer because their definition of play has changed. They don't go out to play anymore. Lifestyles have changed. And I was like, boom, diet theory, exercise theory. And that comment from the brown bag that the food companies are propagating the exercise theory suddenly made a lot of sense. And so I got together with Brent, and uh, we invited the person who made the comment on you know, to join us in this project to start just doing an inventory of what communications are food companies putting out there that are relevant to this topic of obesity. And what we found is that food companies do actively promote the exercise theory in four major ways. Public statements, lobbying, what we call exercise philanthropy, and sports sponsorships. Let me quickly go over these um, one by one. Public statements. You go to the websites of all of these companies, and they talk about exercise, and they use this term balanced lifestyle. Um, Coca-Cola says active, balanced lifestyle. McDonald's says balanced, active lifestyle. GM says balanced and healthy lifestyle. You leave a balanced diet and lifestyle. <laughs> Mars says a well-balanced lifestyle. And Nestle and PepsiCo, they were looking at the same book. They say a balanced lifestyle. 
It's identical, pretty much. Um, and then they talk about exercise and they talk about personal choice. Indra Nui, again, the fountain of great quotes. If all consumers exercised, did what they had to do, the problem of obesity would not exist. Mic drop. Um, the CEO of Coca-Cola, we're doing together, we all have to work together, we have to have active lifestyle programs. CEO of Cadbury Schweppes, it's personal responsibility, there's a decline in personal activity. Not one of them is saying, we are actually contributing in some way, or the food that people eat, not even our food, but other people's food is contributing in some way. It's not about the diet at all. Second, lobbying. Millions and billions of dollars being spent on lobbying, 175 million on lobbying during those three years. Um, I'm gonna talk briefly about a soda tax that was passed in Berkeley in 2015. During the 2014 elections, essentially, in that one town, they spent $30 per voter to oppose a tax of one cent per can, um, which sort of, it, it's indicative of what they feel is the power of that one cent tax in terms of a spillover. So I'm gonna come back to that. Um, you have industry-funded groups that distort research findings. Um, there are these people called the Center for Consumer Freedom, which says, a hefty number of studies has shown that the trend of rising obesity rates can be attributed not to increased intake of food in general or to any particular food or to the influence of restaurants, but rather to less physical activity compounded by a variety of other factors that are constantly being explored. So don't blame anything because we don't know anything yet, is the point there. And I'm gonna come back to the center of consumer freedom in a minute or so. Um, Marion Nestle, she is an industry expert at NYU. Um, she did a study of the industry-funded studies, a study of the studies, and found that out of the 76 studies that were funded by industry, 70 reported results that were favorable to the sponsor. And as a result, there's a direct influence on guidelines and standards and initiatives. The most public one that we saw was Michelle Obama's Let's Move campaign when she moved into the White House. Let's Move, the first thing she did was she made a kitchen garden. And Let's Move was all about the food from the kitchen garden, but very quickly it pivoted to exercise. Um, and in 2014, she actually said, oops, my bad, um, in an op-ed. I shouldn't have done that. Um, and you have all these working groups they had a recommendation for voluntary standards. Voluntary standards shut down. So this sort of thing is happening all the time. Then there's exercise philanthropy, which is essentially donating money. These food companies donating money to um, build um, you know, joint programs to local governments to build parks, playgrounds, gyms, and so on. A few years ago, we were in Melbourne, um, and we have young kids. So we asked the people there, hey, where can we find a playground near where we're staying for our kids to go and you know, burn themselves out and crash at night. And our hosts looked at each other and said, playground, playground, mm, you can go to the McDonald's because every McDonald's has a playground, right? And that's where Australian kids go to play when they're not at school. Um, and you have all these different initiatives. Um, philanthropy, it is money and it is going to a good cause, but it's going in one direction, which is exercise. And ultimately it comes back to something I've said before, you have a 50-pound kid playing soccer for 45 minutes, burns about 120 calories, but then you go to Pepsi's good for you list and take a bottle of strawberry kiwi juice and a reduced calorie granola bar, and that's 320 calories, right? So again, the cycle continues. And the fourth one is sports sponsor sponsorships. I asked my RA to simply go to the websites of every major sports team and every major sports contest in the world and just write down, you know, the food companies that sponsor it. Two days later, she writes to me, says, you know, my spreadsheet has 250 rows, is that enough? And I was like, yes, that is enough. Every major sports contest, every major sports team, hundreds of them literally sponsored by food companies. In fact, the only major sporting event that we found does not have food company sponsorship is Formula One racing. Um, our guess is because in that sport, you sit. <laughs> and we call that um, lean washing. Coming back to the Center for Consumer Freedom, this is the statement that they made, right, that I flashed a little while ago. They also say that a calorie is just a calorie, and this is another industry point. It's just a calorie, calorie in, calorie out. Um, and so we said, you know, let's see what happens if people believe this. So we collected some more data where, these are Americans, we looked at the strength of the belief in the diet lay theory. And so this is similar to the patterns that I showed you earlier. 
that if you believe in the diet lay theory, you're less likely to be overweight. Um, whereas if you believe diet does not matter, you are more likely to be overweight. This line is shifted upwards because this is American data. So you know, the prevalence of overweight is higher in America than in France. We also asked, hey, do you think all calories are the same? Because that's what the industry wants you to believe. And so you could strongly disagree with it, or you could strongly agree with it. Your belief could fall somewhere along that line. And what we find is that the more strongly you agree with it, the more likely you are to be overweight or indeed obese. And in fact, the kicker is, if both your beliefs are wrong, that's when you're in trouble. So if you believe that all calories are the same, and you do not believe the diet lay theory, then on average, your BMI is nearly 30. Whereas if you have at least one correct belief, then you're much more likely to be OK. So this combination of beliefs is really separating out. The people who are completely buying the messaging are the ones who are most likely to have high BMI. And that's what we call lean washing. Food marketing tries to influence people's lay theories of obesity, tries to make them exercise theorists. And so this is a dual effect of what's called big food on obesity. I spent a lot of time at the beginning of this hour talking about the product problems. And this is now a communication problem. And these are two effects. So then what should be done? Um, and so then we started looking into this. And actually, this is a very big problem. It's a systemic problem. And therefore, there are many, many solutions. And there's no one silver bullet. Uh, there is a lot of talk in the popular press that food should be regulated like tobacco. And there are many similarities between the food industries and the tobacco industries. But there are also some very significant dissimilarities. And so it's not obvious that you can just apply the same solutions. But when we started looking at it, we said, you know what? It seems as if the obesity crisis is a case of market failure. What exactly does that mean? We talk about free markets. Um, I'm not an economist, so I had to go back and look at some of the relatively early economics literature to find out what exactly is a free market. And there are some assumptions that underlie free markets, one of which is that people are completely rational. And it turns out over here, definitely, there is irrational behavior going on. You know that you're going to you know, regret eating that slice of cake, but you go ahead and do it anyway because of you know, intertemporal discounting or whatever else you want to call it. And we also know that there's a breakdown of the reveal preference model in this case, because as this wonderful book by Akerlof and Schiller, which I strongly recommend to everyone, says, free markets will not only provide us with what we want as long as we can pay for it, they will also tempt us into buying things that are bad for us, whatever the costs. Right? And so that's a problem with free markets. So then we start looking at, OK, what exactly is a free market? What are the criteria that make a market qualify as free or not free? And by the way, this word free is brilliant. I'm a marketing person. I think this is perfect branding. What's bad about free? Free is fantastic. But it actually, the English meaning does not apply here at all, as I learned. There are three ways in which you can say a market is failing. The first is monopoly power or lack of competition. Clearly, this does not apply for the food market. There's no monopoly over here. There's tons of competition. So let's rule this out. The second is there's asymmetric information between producers and consumers. Do producers know something that consumers don't? Turns out, yes. I've spent a lot of time talking about lean washing and people's mistaken beliefs. right? So that, to me, is a clear indication of asymmetric information. I haven't talked about children, but you know, children, I said in the beginning, are a major target of the advertising of the food industry. And what they're learning about the food they're eating is also mistaken. So that is, again, asymmetric information. The third criterion as externalities. And in, to my completely lay understanding of this, an externality basically means if you have a transaction between a producer and a consumer, the producer is giving you some benefits, and the consumer is paying some price, basically the sum total of all the benefits and costs should be factored into the price of that transaction. If there's somebody else who's paying an additional price, that's an externality. And what we find here is that there are social costs of obesity. You know, you eat the burger, and you get overweight, and you get diabetic, then your health insurance is paying for it, and the government is paying for it, and you are paying for it, your future self is paying for it. Right? That's one thing. And the second, there's some evidence for social contagion of obesity. If it's OK to be overweight, because everybody else is overweight, then you become overweight as well. And then it becomes OK to be obese, because everybody else is obese, so you become obese as well. Right? And so that is also an externality. And therefore, there is a need for corrective mechanisms. Pictorially, you have market failure, asymmetric information, externalities, monopoly power, therefore need for corrective mechanisms. 
what possible corrective mechanisms are there. So my co-author, Anil Karnani, has actually written a paper on what are the different ways on which you can correct, uh, have corrective forces on markets. A very nice typology of four corrective mechanisms. The first being consumer activism. And we conclude that here, in this market, this is sporadic, and this is ineffective for many reasons. So it's really feel good. Occupy Wall Street, demonstrate, whatever, but nothing really comes out of it, right? Because it's very hard to coordinate people. Second, industry self-regulation. That's clearly not happening here. And I believe this is a great opportunity. Because if you're an industry member in the food industry who actually wants to do good, well, everybody wants to lose weight. Everybody wants to be healthy. This is a massive opportunity that many firms are missing out on. Um, but some firms are capitalizing on. And so that's an opportunity right there. Then there's corporate social responsibility. This is not incentive compatible. There is no incentive for a food company to actually do socially responsible actions in their own industry. The social responsibility that you see is often donations to charity in completely unrelated areas, which is all very feel good. It's for maximum visibility, not maximum impact. And that's why we said it's often, meaning always, irrelevant. And so that leaves government intervention. Um, we found this is unreliable, mainly due to lobbying. But the fact is that this may be the best option. So then the question is, how can this be made to work? Um, in the paper, we sort of do a taxonomy of all the different sorts of um, policy tools, the market failures, what, the, what are their upsides and downsides. Not going to go into this in any detail, but I want to focus on taxes a little bit um, going forward. Because essentially what we feel is that there are policy implications. There is you know, a lot of research that can be done on the firm side. There's a lot of research that can be done on the consumer psychology side. Uh, so we've started doing a review of sugar taxes, because sugar taxes have suddenly become popular over the last year. Um, and I have a slide on this. If I have time on that, I'll share that with you. But to me, more interesting is that this is a mechanism design problem. You can do taxes, which are punitive. They're externally imposed. But I like to be believe, as a behaviorist, that if you change the system, or if you change the structure of a system, then firms will react accordingly. So how can we change the system in such a way that food companies' incentives align with the public interest? I think that's a massive question. And it would be a far more permanent solution than any taxation. On the consumer psychology side, um, we're running a lot of data on attitudes to food constituents, such as GMOs. Um, and so some new data on that, funded by IEMS. There was a question earlier about what happened to those who believe equally in diet exercise. Does exercise really have no effect? I said that you don't see so many people in the data. And that's why you don't get anything. Another problem is that exercise self-reports are often not accurate because people vastly overstate how much they exercise. And so you need physiological data, and there's scope for large-scale intervention studies. Good news is that Abhir Rupa and I, just earlier this week, um, we fielded some interest from an insurance company, which is happy to give us access to people's blood reports on a regular basis for diabetics. Um, and these people are self-motivated to exercise. And so we might be onto something interesting over there um, in case the IEMS is interested, nudge, nudge, wink, wink. Uh, we might talk later. Um, we're also looking at where do these beliefs come from over time? How do children's beliefs over, uh, evolve over time? So with Young in the audience, um, some more work on that. So a lot of stuff going on over there. But I think I'm just going to talk about the sugar taxes and then stop, because I'm running out of time. Before 2016, you had sugar taxes in certain parts of the world in various different formats, Hungary, France, Mexico, Denmark. Norway, some of these Polynesian countries that we talked about. Then in 2015, like I mentioned, Berkeley was the first American city to tax high-calorie sugary drinks. Then in 2016, the WHO released a study saying that there is evidence that appropriately designed taxes on sugar-sweetened beverages would result in reductions in consumption, especially if they're heavy. The retail price is raised at least by 20%. Remember, I was talking about a one-cent tax on a can of soda, which is much less than 20%. But in the 2016 elections, among other world-changing events, soda taxes were approved in a number of American cities. And we also expect several European countries are going to introduce these taxes. And there's a lot of debate going on. Australia, New Zealand, sure, but also in emerging, country, uh, emerging markets like Brazil, Colombia, Philippines, Indonesia, and India. So it seems as if several parts of the world are actually following through on this. And then the question is, does it really work? And the preliminary signs are actually very positive. So in Berkeley, 
that one cent tax has shown, uh, has resulted in a 21% drop in consumption of sugar sweetened beverages. You don't know whether this is due to the money alone or is it also due to the increased awareness of the problem, but it's having an effect. At the same time, consumption increased by 4% in comparison cities. And actually, um, the consumption of water went up in Berkeley as well. So people are substituting soda with water, which is exactly what, from a public health point of view, you would want them to do. In Mexico, there was a 6% decrease in purchases of taxed beverages, and the effect was most pronounced for the poorer households. So again, there's a straight economic incentive there. And so it is definitely working, it seems. Of course, there's pushback. The American Beverage Association sank something like 38 million or 38 billion something dollars um, into the campaigns against these taxes. They lost all of them. And now um, billionaires like Michael Bloomberg and John Arnold have jumped into the fray, and they're willing to bankroll the push for taxes. So this is a very interesting development that's happening in the US um, and every other part of the world. Um, I think I'm going to stop right there because I have run out of time pretty much. This is the thank you slide for IEMS. Um, and I'm happy to field any questions. Thanks for your attention. So I appreciate the <laughs> acknowledgement of our funding and the There's actually two thank you slides. That's great. <laughs> so yeah, for, tweet this. Uh, I think we have some time for questions. So any questions from the audience? Yeah. Yeah. So even if you apply these policies across the U.S., for example, I don't think you would. I don't think you would see a. I mean, a level, you know, a constant level of, um, you know, of fitness or uh, health in the U.S. because there are strong cultural differences even in the U.S. Like the South tends to be more obese than the North, or California is very different from the rest of the US. So, and I think these problems even magnify when you look on like a global scale. I mean, like the Middle East, uh, you know, if you look at like the top 10 fattest obese countries in the world, like most of them are in the Middle East. Or so my question is how do you how do you change these policies to match the different cultures of the world or yeah, and, and how, also how if we have a new new science or a new diet, you know, how do we how do we apply these to different cultures. I mean, a ketogenic diet probably won't work in India where most people can't eat meat. Right? That's an excellent question. Um, it's, it's going off, you know, it's going beyond what I talked about today because there was a question earlier about calories, right? And I said, so far I'm just focusing on calories, not going to nutrients. And, you know, what are calories and nutrients but they're food? Um, people who have thought deeply about this say that one major cause of this obesity crisis is the move towards processed convenient foods, pre-processed convenient foods. And so in fact, if we were just all going to move back to more traditional diets, and it doesn't matter where you're from, just eat the traditional diet, you'd be more likely to be okay. The problem is that it's much more effort intensive to eat a traditional, to cook, prepare, and source a traditional diet. Plus, like I said earlier, um, the fruits and vegetables themselves are getting less and less nutrient rich, right? Um, but there's, um, there's this guy called Michael Pollan, who is a food writer. And he has a very short uh, slogan, which basically says, eat food, okay? Don't eat edible food-like products, like the McDonald's French fries with 17 ingredients, or the white bread with 53 ingredients. Just eat food. Not too much, mostly plants, right? And if you can just stick to that rule, that rule can be applied to all cultures, you know, India, Norway, Korea, whatever. Yeah? But if we can focus on that, I think that a lot of these problems are going to go away. Any other c comments or questions? Yeah. Davis? Yeah, um, Davis. Yeah, it's great, great talk. Thank you. Um, Davis, can you take things. this? First of all, I, I guess maybe not in support of the exercise, but I, it, it seems like I've seen some studies that show that people who live in inner cities are, are demonstrably more fit and, and uh, less obese than people that live outside in the suburban areas. So, and, and that's always been attributed to the fact that they walk more. Yes. And so it's not an active exercise, but it's, a, it's part of their lifestyle. So yes. maybe the lifestyle is a bit. The second thing I, I wanted to get your reaction to is that I've also been reading about that some of the 
criticism of some of this pre-processed food is that it's so much cheaper. And there's this food equity issue that goes on in inner cities where there's not local produce available, um, in these food deserts, uh, I think that Michael Pollan yes. talks about that as well, yes. that the only available source of food are these really high uh, sodium cans of crap from the corner store or McDonald's, which is actually cheap when you really think about it. Compare yes. the calories that you get from McDonald's versus how much you would have to pay to you know, fix your own food. And so there's, there's, a, an economic, uh, uh, there's an economic issue along with this as well. Absolutely. Thanks. Those both points are very well taken. Um, before I forget, let me try the first one first, which is um, you said about inner cities and suburbs, right? So yeah, so you know, in one of the studies that I zipped through, there's a factor called residential location. That is exactly meant to account for that. Because there are two differences between people who live in inner cities and who live in suburbs. One, like you said, is that in the inner cities you walk more, right? But the other is you're also likely to be poorer. Um, in the suburbs, you're likely to be richer. And if you're richer, then that's your second point. You have access to better food. Whereas in the inner cities, you have access to the processed, the soda, uh, the McDonald's, the soda, and so on. Um, and that's, again, absolutely correct. This goes back to the question of taxes and free markets and so on. If you think about what goes into making that can of soda so cheap, essentially it's so cheap because of all the subsidies that go into the corn, right? And so, in fact, and this is something that I hadn't thought about earlier, the food market is not free because there is so much subsidy going into it anyway. And the taxes that we are proposing are sort of a minor correction on the level of that subsidy, right? If we were to take the subsidies away, then the soda wouldn't be as cheap, not nearly as cheap, the burgers wouldn't be as cheap as well. And in fact, it would be much more economically profitable to have local gardens and uh, local kitchen gardens and so on. Um, it, it is a huge problem that, for some reason, normal food has become premium. And so organic has this label on it. And in fact, there's some research that's just come out that says um, poor people who use food stamps to pay for organic food are actually looked at as being profligate. Um, and they are chastised. Um, so there are all these very weird associations that are going on in people's heads now, simply because what should be normal has now become premium and a status symbol. And what should be the occasional indulgence, really, has become the subsidized daily routine thing. So like I said, these are systemic problems. There are lots and lots of different contributing factors. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? I had a, a couple of very quick things. Yeah. Um, one is that once a lot of economic theory, and welfare theory, just assumes that the consumer's preferences are kind of fixed mm -hmm. and then tries to see what is the, you know, right. how, how do markets deliver efficient uh, right. outcomes. But once you're in the realm where uh, those preferences can be shaped by advertisement and money, then it's very hard to even think about welfare because yes. it's not clear whether if a, if a preference changes due to, due to advertisement, whether that's uh, just as a legitimate type of welfare if they're happy with this, you know, taught preference or yeah. whether that's somehow a bad, we should ignore that, they're not acting in their self-interest. And it gets very hard, right? Similar to like election financing where politicians can spend money to buy, basically buy votes uh, in ways that, you know, give them an advantage that this somehow people have a sense that's not right either. And, so, and the only response really then, I think, is, is direct regulation like, you know, warnings on cigarette packs, you know, warnings mm -hmm. on these. I don't know how the warnings would be, but I'm not sure if people have looked at that. And, and, and the last thing I just want to say is the research agenda is really fascinating, but I feel there's still kind of a missing link, the direct link between the advertisement as shaping the lay beliefs. Oh, absolutely. You paint a, you paint a very good circumstantial case, yes, right? Yes, yes. That this is, but there are many things happening, the processed food, other things that also have been po proposed as yep. explanations yeah. for the rise in obesity. So absolutely. that would be okay. interesting to think about how to tackle Oh, you're that. absolutely right. The last one is actually um, the easiest one for me to handle because I've faced that question many times before. And my canned response to that is it took 50 years of research by thousands of people to establish a link between smoking and cancer. Um, 
right? And even now, that particular link is questioned. And so this is absolutely cir circumstantial, um, which is why some of the research that I show you, again, graduate student alert, is not going to get into a top journal. It's not in top academic journals, right? But I think that's a problem with the journals rather than anything else. You're absolutely right that it's going to take years and years of, you know, very different research to, you know, I, I cannot show anything with, uh, with four years worth of data even. It's not conclusive. So absolutely taken. Um, I'm going to skip your question about the election thing, because I know absolutely nothing about that. But I'm going to go back to your first point, which is about, um, so what if preferences are labile? You know? And you said preferences are influenced by advertising. But you know, the field where I'm coming from, preferences aren't just influenced by advertising. Even within a person, in the absence of advertising, preferences change from moment to moment, time to time, depending on all sorts of contextual factors. And yes, that is a problem for you know, the theory that is built on the assumption of consistent preferences. And that's the whole point of the Akerlof and Schiller book, really, which is you know, the, these theories need to be re-looked at by people you know, who are competent to look at these theories, certainly not me. Um, but you're right. I think. In the absence of, that theory, of such a theory, we don't know what to predict, right? And that is a problem for us. But I feel, in, from that perspective, may, I'm not sure the market failure framework is the most, the best way to frame the problems. Because I think that's built on a, a lot of, a different kind of set of assumptions. It is, but it the is. The Akalov stuff is more, I think. So, but, uh, uh, well, the, again, I know very little about this, but yeah. My understanding is we were essentially sh demonstrating an application of Ackerloff and, uh, uh, and Schiller's propositions. Uttar? Yeah. This is a fascinating talk, but I think Thank the you. weak link is between the belief and the action. And I use a sample size of one, which is me. I'm one of those guys whose lay theories is that food is important. Mm -hmm. So according to you, the guy who thinks that food is important would actually eat less. Actually, I eat more. On average. On average. On average. On average. We have outliers. So You're welcome to be my outlier. The graduate student should actually design an experiment which links the belief with action. We have. Actually, I skipped over that. We have. Uh, so there's two ways. One is you measure someone's belief, and you measure the action. So you know, the way, easy way to measure the belief is just ask them, what do you believe? You know, this or that. And we saw that people who believe the diet thing, we gave them candies to eat. Hershey's kisses, they ate less Hershey's kisses than the people who believed um, the exercise thing. Another way to do it is you give people the belief. So that's called priming. You tell them that this is what science has shown. And on average, you know, if on average everybody's somewhere in the middle, right? People who read this, they shift a little bit this way. People who read this shift a little bit that way. So you get a separation between two groups. And again, we found that with that separation, the people who believe the exercise thing eat more of these candies than people who eat the, um, the diet thing. So no, that's a fantastic question, very well taken. And that's one of the things we had to show. Thank you. OK, maybe we should uh, call it to a close here. And I want to really thank Anna Brown for a terrific talk. And I think this is one of the most valuable talks we've had. Wow. I have great confidence that the average weight of people in this room will fall <laughs> in the next year or something. <laughs> average. <laughs> for all the people whose average. beliefs have been corrected by this seminar. <laughs> so you. I think we've done a great public service. Thanks, so, Albert. Thank you, so thank much. you very much.